Uh, hi, good morning. Stan Stahl here with Secure the Village and welcome to our webinar. Uh, this month we're going to be talking once again, it's our third, uh, third, third session on the California Consumer Privacy Act and this time we'll be talking about minimum reasonable security practices. Uh, this presentation is brought to you by my company Citadel and also the Pepperdine Graziadio Business School and their very innovative CYRP program. Also a time to call out Cybersecure LA 2019. Cybersecurity is a team sport. Get that on your calendar, Mark, October 17th. Uh, first time announcement, we just found out Brad Ross, who's a fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, will be our keynote speaker. He uh, has a lot of roles at, at NIST, uh, one of which is his risk management framework. So you certainly want to get to uh, the, put that, as I say, put that on your calendar for October 17th. And with that, let me introduce my guest today, uh, Rachel Capocia. She's a partner at the law firm of Jeffrey Mangles, Butler and Mitchell. And Rachel, we're, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Stan, and good morning, everybody. Um, I am an IP litigator here at Jeffrey Mangles, um, but I began my professional life as a, com a computer software developer, where I wrote computer graphics and computer automation software for 10 years before going to law school. As a result, my law practice has all been in the technology field or in the computer field in various ways. I do a lot of patent litigation, a lot of copyright litigation, particularly related to software, and then in recent years have been involved quite a bit in privacy and cybersecurity counseling or breach responses and things like that. So it's all been sort of a marriage of the two, uh, my two areas. It, it's natural, if you will, that when we start talking about security and privacy, having somebody who both gets the legal side of it and also understands some of the technology is a, uh, just a, a real asset to, to have. I uh, also have to call out two of your partners, both of whom have been on these webinars before, Bob Braun and, and Michael Gold. Bob and I published a paper uh, back in 2005 on emerging standards of care in information security. We published that initially in a security book, a handbook, and then Michael Gold uh, took that and we, re we recast it somewhat for a journal that he edited, uh, and that was in 2006 or 2007. So what we're talking about today has a, has a long pedigree, a long history with with uh, with your firm and 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 me this way. So it's 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 kind of brings it back old homes week in a, in a, in a, in a sense that way. Uh, one thing I want to do before we start, uh, I, I, could, I can't let the day go by without just noticing noti and, and noting um, that today's the 75th anniversary of, of the, uh, the, the invasion of Normandy uh, that was the uh, beginning of the end, if you will, uh, of World War II. It was the uh, uh, landing on the beaches of, of France. Uh, I had the, 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 uh, I mean, the opportunity to, to be in Normandy. I actually took this photograph several years ago. And I want to call it out. I mean, we are here today, in part, we stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, the, the men and, and some women, but mostly at those days, men, uh, who uh, fought for us. And in our own way, uh, without overstating, of course, where we are today, but uh, just like then, it, it, we had to mobilize the entire country uh, to to uh, beat, uh, beat beat the Nazis and, and, and win World War II. Uh, I remember stories my mother would tell me uh, about you know the the rationing that went on and the you know all, all the the sacrifices that that they made back for us. I want to call that out, but also point out that in today's world, part of the challenge we have and part of Part of what we started Secure the Village all about was the same idea. We've got to get everybody involved in the cybersecurity, uh, cyber privacy battles, if you, if you will. Um, so uh, let's let's honor those 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 men and women who died for us. Uh, at the same time, recognizing that now, in its own way, 
much smaller way, but still in its own way. It's it's our turn now that we've got to do the things that we have to do to protect freedoms. And and when you look at the full scope of cybersecurity, cyber privacy, there's no question but that our freedoms are at risk. Uh, so uh, let me just say that. Let me stop there and 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 move on to to today's webinar. Um, so we're going to be talking about CCPA, uh, mostly what the consequences of not reasonable might be, not having reasonable security practices. And then we're going to get into a little bit of discussion around what reasonableness might mean. And then we're going to explore uh, the work that Secure the Village is doing as a community to build what we see as minimum reasonable security practices, a floor, if you will, on uh, on what might be reasonable. The idea that if you're not doing these things, uh, you have no claim uh, to, to be reasonable. And, and I know Rachel will get into the discussions. You're a litigator, what it has to be like when you've got to go in and defend a company who has been, uh, uh, you know, who, who, who is being sued. Um, and the question of reasonableness comes up. So um, let's start. And, and Rachel, you want to just give us a brief summary of, of the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, and obviously comp emphasizing those things in, in the blue that are the subject for today. Right. So as I'm sure everybody's aware, the California Consumer Privacy Act is set to, to go into effect in January of 2020, although I don't think enforcement will start until July of 2020. And it includes a number of requirements for companies who uh, meet certain criteria and who do business in the state of California and maintain information about uh, or data about California residents. Um, in particular, it includes, as Stan pointed out, uh, as we have highlighted here in blue, it while it includes rights of disclosure, deletion, and to opt out for people who are affected by it, uh, the more important things we want to talk about today are things like there is the right to be compensated in the event of a data breach. Now, this right for California consumers is can be a private right of action in which a, a consumer who has been the subject of a data breach can uh, sue uh, a company on their own behalf. It includes statutory damages, and it can also include um, uh, lawsuits brought by the Attorney General's Office of California. So there's a range of things that can happen in the event of a data breach. Um, it applies to for-profit companies who collect consumers' personal information. Um, it, the three uh, excuse me, requirements are listed here, uh, the potential requirements for when you are covered by this law. And then finally, in order to meet the requirements of the CCPA, you have to install reasonable security procedures and practice, practices appropriate to the nature of the information being protected in, in order to be able to be protected by this law. So, yeah. Did I miss anything, Stan, that you think is important? I, I, I don't think so. I think that was a super summary. I mean, and um, I, I would only call people's attention to the very first of these uh, webinars on, on CCPA, where we went into this whole subject in, in much greater detail. We had a whole panel of attorneys on it at that time, um, and including, I think, Bob was, Bob Braun. Yeah, Bob was, was one of those. And uh, we also had Howard Miller uh, of our board uh, discussing the whole subject as well from the insurance perspective. Because uh, there's, I mean, you start looking at, at what the costs of this can be in uh, of, of the California Consumer Privacy Act in uh, the event, let's say, of a breach. Uh, this is not something you want to go into without having good cyber insurance and making sure that the cyber insurance is, is, is covered. Uh, one of the things that surfaced in that first meeting, the, the first webinar, uh, was just that this is this law is still very much in a state of flux, and and the next chart kind of shows this. There's laws that have already passed the assembly, uh, and laws that are being in the assembly uh, for passing. Um, and again, if if you want to just kind of summarize these as, and kind of how do you see this playing out? Because again, you you're, you you see it from that legal perspective. I don't. I don't see that. I, I, I kind of see it very operationally that way. Uh, um, these, these are the details that don't so much matter to me. Yeah, you know, but, one thing I want to add, Stan, actually from our last slide that I, I didn't include, but I think it's important, is that um, 
un the amounts of money that can be awarded under this statute for a, a breach, and you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it can be seven hundred and fifty mm -hmm. to a thousand dollars per. Seven fifty for this piece of it, yeah. Right yeah. per per mm -hmm. uh, c consumer whose data was breached. That mm -hmm. can add up to a lot of money really, really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, there's this private right of action. There's a long history in California of providing these sort of uh, state or private attorney general uh, procedures that allow regular people to go in and be able to sue under these things. And it's been um, the scourge of, of uh, companies, but a real boon to consumers in the state. So I expect there to be a lot of activity under that right of action uh -huh. um, as we move forward. Anyway, so I, yeah. let me go forward to the changes. Well, and, and just to, to continue that point a bit, as we start to talk about private right of action, it's one thing if you or I or anybody else as an individual brings a private right of action, I would expect class action suits to be those private rights of action. So we just assemble all the victims of a breach that way. Is that? That's, that's right. That, that, I, I, that certainly has been the history and other statutes that have been like that in the yeah. state. Right, right, right. So then, if if we look at you know how this stuff is is you know, just kind of working its way through the between now and and January first, let's say, uh, I mean, one of the things that um, has to happen, and, and we talked about this on the first webinar, we had two different definitions of personal information in two different California laws. So I guess that's being clarified uh, as as well. Uh, what it means to de-identify information, um, you know, and, and I don't understand this third one that requires data brokers. Uh, well, I do understand, sorry, to, to honor consumer opt-outs, but I guess what I don't understand about it is why that wouldn't be obvious from the law in the, in the first place uh, there. Um, you know, you know I, one, I don't know. Thing, you know, one thing I wanted to point out here is that the Attorney General's office has been engaged in rulemaking and they've hosted a variety of public forums around the state, allowing interested people to come in and make comments. And so a lot of these changes have come from that process, have come from the process of people coming in and saying what the issues are. Um, I attended one of these here in Los Angeles, and it was interesting because you had a lot of uh, stakeholders would show up and, and asked questions. And many of those questions were things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was thinking as I was hearing them that it seems obvious to me from the law how that would have come out. The statute's not perfectly written, obviously, and none of them ever are, but people did often raise uh, quote unquote issues that to me felt like maybe not issues. And so I agree with you. I'm not sure why this one wasn't clear to people from the original law, but I suspect that's where some of this comes from. Um, enough people would stand up and talk about these issues and problems in either submitted um, issues or in these public forums. Mm -hmm. um, what I found in going in attending that forum was that you had a really interesting range of people, whether it just be, you know, regular people off the street, there was a little bit of crack potitude of just sort of crazy people with crazy ideas about what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there were lots and lots and lots of people. And the people that I saw that I saw reflected the most were small business owners who were coming in saying, you know, I, I'm being very, very concerned about how they were going to comply with yeah. the law. Well, and, so and I think, these, yeah, so I'm sorry. So that's where these exemptions and exceptions have come from is from mm -hmm. uh, this process and hearing what the issues that people have come and raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I started to say, and it, it, it seems that way as I look at this, that on the one hand, when I, when I put on my consumer hat and I look at all the information being collected about me, whether it's by Google or AT&T or, you know, whoever it is, the big companies that are doing that and obviously selling it and, and so on. Um, as a consumer, it's like, yeah, I would like certainly some more control over this. When I look at this as a uh, first a small business ourselves, we are, Citadel is, and then the kind of work that we do, which are mostly for mid-sized and smaller businesses, this, this really... Uh, puts a set of obligations on these smaller businesses that uh, there's a hump that they have to get over uh, in order to get compliant with this, whether it's the the uh, information inventory and all that was the subject of, of last month's webinar, or as we get into what are reasonable security procedures and practices now, uh, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's um, 
it's 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 a hump. There's 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 work here that that has to be done for these companies to really get compliant with with the laws. Uh, on the one hand, again, as a small business owner, I can be uh, very sympathetic to that. Uh, as even you know, looking at it as from the secure the village perspective, uh, and when we as a company go in and we assess uh, new clients for their readiness for these kinds of things, and we find frankly that they're just not ready. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's there. There's so much work that, that they have to do. Um, it, it seems that you know we we are pushing the we're pushing the envelope. We're raising the bar here uh, in in ways that are going to be difficult, uh, as I say, initially to get over some of these humps. Uh, but also, I think as a society. Uh, really necessary when we look at all the, uh, the the threats that are out there, business email compromise and ransomware. And again, we've got a webinar you can go watch that from a few months ago where where we where we looked at this. Um, when we when we look at the um, kind of the legal importance, it goes to what you say that uh, there's statutory damages of between 100 and 750 dollars per incident for consumers whose personal information has been compromised by a breach resulting from the businesses and here's what i see where we get to the you know the, the meat of this resulting from the businesses violation of the duty to implement reasonable security and procedures and practices appropriate to the nature of the information to protect that information uh, this is where the rubber meets the road i see yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, that's that's absolutely correct. And so, you know, this doesn't say you are uh, subject to these types of damages simply for having a breach. You're only subject to the damages if you have a breach and you show that you didn't take reasonable security measures to be able to protect um, from that breach based on the kind of information that you have. And I think a lot of people uh, worry about that because I think in the end, it's going to be, I'd like to say, impossible to protect all information from breaches always. Breaches are going to happen. There's no getting around it. Uh, I wish there were, but I'm afraid there is not. And so as a result, <clears throat> businesses are going to be compromised. Information is going to be compromised. But you have to implement procedures that are reasonable. And by reasonable, that can be flexible because it's going to matter based on the type of information that you have. If the information that you collect about California consumers is, you know, something that can't be used to identify individuals or households, something much more general and broad than that, um, you know, let's say it's something like neighborhood information. This neighborhood tends to vote in this way or something like that, information that is more general and de-identified. Then it's going to be a lot, either you're going to have no requirements or the requirements are going to be much more simple on what it is required for you to implement reasonable security procedures. That said, most businesses are going to go off and copy or keep information like the names and addresses and email IDs and things like that of their customers. And as a result, all of that starts to be personal information that can be breached and can subject you to some of these fines. And so keeping in mind the differences in types of information that you can have, reasonable security measures are going to differ based on what that is. You know, somebody's medical information is going to have quite different requirements than uh, somebody's address like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to have to understand what it is you've got, but once you do that, then it's going to, that's going to play into what is going to be a reasonable security procedure in practice. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I want to mention, and maybe you, I, I didn't catch whether you mentioned this already, but the statute doesn't define what's a reasonable security procedure in practice. And right. that, Next you know, slide. so that's the problem. Yeah. With that, with that question, it leaves us to wonder, how are we going to be able to tell what's reasonable? And unfortunately, the real answer to that is going to be, we're going to have to watch and see what happens as the, uh, as the CCPA is modified and as case law comes out telling us where we come out in various litigations. Mm -hmm. But Stan and the folks at the Citadel and Secure the Village are trying to do something to help everybody figure out what those practices are now. Right, and it, I mean, w well said. I mean, and we see this the uh, totally begs this question as to what are reasonable, and 
what we're also seeing, and I'm going to ask you to comment as well, um, we're not the only state in the country that's paying attention to this. Uh, New York State a couple of years ago implemented a set of regulations for financial services companies doing business in New York. Uh, their uh, legislature just passed a bill that makes having reasonable security procedures and practices a requirement for any business uh, that does that has information in their databases about New York residents, and that's modeled after that New York State regulations. I just saw something yesterday. Massachusetts has analogous things uh, coming out of their breach disclosure laws. They've up, uh, updated those. So I think, uh, and again, again, please, please jump in and, and add to this. But it, it would seem reasonable to me, if I can use the word reasonable in in this context, that. We're going to see more and more states, perhaps the federal government as well, uh, getting involved as to, well, what exactly is reasonable? You know, that, that whole question. Yeah. There, are a t <clears throat> there are a ton of states that are coming up with laws that are similar or analogous to um, California CCPA. I think the last thing I saw said there are 25 different states that either have promulgated or are proposing data security uh, practices and measures. And those include, you know, states like Texas and Florida and Oregon and Washington and, you know, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be a challenge because each of those laws is going to be different. Each of those laws is going to define PII or personally identifiable information differently. Um, I've done, you know, our group has done um, surveys or analysis of definitions of just PII across all of the states that have any kind of legislation about this. And while the definitions are similar, they differ across all of these different states' boundaries, which is going to make it incredibly challenging for companies yeah. um, to be able to deal with these <coughs> legislations. <coughs> You know, you would hope that the federal government will come in eventually and perhaps come up with something that uh, is nationwide, uh, although it's hard to imagine that happening in any reasonable time frame. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that a lot of companies think about in this area, of course, is um, the European directive, the GDPR, which uh, was enacted um, a little while ago, and that got everybody really that was when we first started to see companies getting really, really agitated about getting their uh, data practices in line. Now, yeah. complying with GDPR is not, uh, will not completely cover you for compliance with CCPA or probably the New York law or other laws that are coming up. So, uh, but it is, it, it is something to think about. If you've gone down that road, that's going to have got you at least partly there. So I think mm -hmm. it's yeah. I mean, and, and as we've talked about, and we'll see later as well, we just, one of the first things you have to do if you're going to have reasonable practices is know where your information, know what your information is and where it is. And if you've done GDPR, you've already got a leg up on on, on that piece of it as, as well. Uh, I want to move on to the next slide because it begins to get into the essence of, okay, what might reasonable practices be? And I start this slide with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, it doesn't get down to the level of practices, if you will. It's more a framework for practices, but I see that. Uh, there's the Center for Internet Security. Uh, in 2016, Kamala Harris, who was then Attorney General before she became Senator, uh, wrote a the data breach report in which she called out the Center for Internet Security's 20 controls as reasonable practice procedures and practices. Uh, there's the New York State regs that we've talked about, uh, NIST 800-171, which applies to organizations primarily that are playing in the, in the aerospace industry uh, that have unclassified but really sensitive information. There's the payment card industry standard uh, for organizations that take credit cards. There's, of course, HIPAA. We all know about HIPAA. There's Graham Leach Bliley, which is the corresponding for financial services organizations. And then there's the, in, in, in some sense, the gold standard of ISO uh, 270102 certification. Uh, all of these are candidate descriptors, but uh, I don't see, you don't see them as being the, the right answer here either. You wanna kind of jump in and talk about that piece as well? Yeah. These are things that 
companies often come and ask us about. If I'm complying with X, is that going to be enough? And, you know, each of these has its benefits. Each of them has their drawbacks. And we could have an entire uh, webinar about that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and as we've talked about, you know, we certainly have views about about each of these. You know, I'll give you, for example, the NIST framework, I think, is um, a, a very, it's a good framework. It has sort of everything you need, but it's very complex. It's really long. And, and whenever I find that I've found someone who says, oh, well, we can we can conform to the NIST cybersecurity framework or even the NIST 800-171 requirements, um, it often turns into a bunch of policies that kind of parrot what's in the NIST framework without a lot of underlying necessarily understanding of how some of those things should really be implemented. So I, I, I feel like that framework is often feels to me like it's used more as a crutch at, instead of anything that's actually really useful. Um, the Center for Internet Security 20, I think, is a really good, uh, it's a very good set of controls, and it's more, to me, it's more realistic in that it gives you a better idea of what you really need to do and some real uh, uh, specific ideas of how to, how to improve your security. But as you folks have noticed, it's probably too much for a lot of smaller companies and a lot of it's, it, and it can seem probably very daunting. Um, but when you get to some of the more specific ones, like the payment card industry standards or HIPAA or Graham Leach Bliley, all of those things have their specific categories, um, but they each focus on something that's very specific to the area that they're in. Like the payment card industry, uh, you know, those the payment card providers have specific things that they're concerned about. It is not necessarily the same thing that consumers are concerned about. Um, it, they certainly dovetail, but it's not necessarily everything. So those are all going to leave out big chunks of information that, that you're going to need. If you're complying with some set of these, then you're definitely going to be somewhere down the road, but probably not far enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Um, and what you said about the Center for Internet Security, now what is already going on two and a half years ago, uh, Secure the Village took the Center for Internet Security 20 and built from those a set of basic IT security management standards that let's say you're a CFO and you have to hire an IT vendor and you don't understand security, you're not a technical person, you're a finance person, how do you kind of navigate this? So we took the Center for Internet Security 20 and wrote this basic code of IT security management practices as something that the buyer of IT security services could turn to their vendor and say, do this without having to know what it all means. It's just, there it is, you know, let the, the technical people will know what it means, let them go do it kind of thing. As we'll move on and we're about to start the the, the dialogue on, on reasonableness, uh, we, we've recast that and rebuilt that into the reasonableness definition. Uh, so with that, I, I wanna start as, to me, what is the essence of reasonableness? Uh, it's, it's a quote from a major general, Brett Williams, after the Sony breach, what is now going on four years, four and a half years ago, he was on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, and Stephanopoulos at the end of the show, the round table, if you watch, if you watch Stephanopoulos every Sunday like we do, uh, says to, to Williams, he says, so if a company comes to you and says, what do we do? Uh, Williams says, the number one thing at the board level and CEO level is to take cybersecurity as seriously as you take business operations and financial operations. It's not good enough to go to your CIO and say, are we good to go? You've got to be able to ask questions and understand the answers. And in some sense, I, I see this as, as what the essence of reasonableness. Are you taking this stuff seriously? If you're looking at it as a bunch of things, you check box, yep, we're doing that, yep, we're doing that, with no understanding of anything, but you're simply, do we comply? That's not taking it seriously. If you've got a program, now you're taking it seriously, and that gets us to these minimum standards that, that we have put together uh, for, for uh, uh, CCPA and and others. Uh, it's a, it's a set of 
practices you know that that an organization has to implement it's based on the above standards it's based on all of these things like you said rachel you know if you're doing these you got a leg up towards what's reasonableness so it's it's based on those it's analogous to the basic it security management practices and it's intended to be a straw man in the community dialogue we don't pretend to have all the answers here uh what we do believe we have is a good starting point for what this minimum reasonableness is. Um, that's that's kind of how we set about the structure of, okay, what do we want to do here? And use that as a guide, you know, as you advise clients and they say, okay, what do I have to do? Uh, again, resources are limited. They, you know, no matter how seriously they take security, resources are finite so you can't throw infinite dollars at this uh it staffs are shorthanded already you know you can't do everything that needs to be done so what's what's kind of again the, the word reasonable surfaces uh, a guide for insurance providers as well if you're going to insure companies uh perhaps you ask them okay do you meet this minimum um and a guide one of the things that i've not seen discussed here at all in ccpa um but if you're a financial institution you're a bank and you've got a line of credit out for a company and all of a sudden you know they got 10,000 names in their database they just get a breach there's now a class action suit you got 10,000 times a thousand as your exposure that's 10,000 times a hundred I'm sorry a million dollars worth of exposure and they don't have insurance let's say that covers that your loan line of credit to them can be at risk as well I mean are we tracking here is this kind of an accurate what I just said you know you're about the reasonable security practices yeah. I, yeah. I certainly and, think so yeah. and you know as we're, we're going to talk more in a minute about some of the details but a couple things I wanted to I wanted to say sort of overall mm -hmm. um, we've approached our discussion Stan when you and I have talked about this a little bit of you know you've said to me what do you do when uh, how do you def what do you need to be able to defend your client? You're the litigator here. How do you defend your client in these situations? Mm -hmm. And to step back from that a second, one of the things that, that we preach here all the time, and I think you said this a couple of minutes ago as well, is there's a few things that I think you're going to have to do no matter what that, that um, uh, inform all of the steps that we're going to talk about in a minute. And the first of those is you really have to know your data. And we, we in our group here at Jeffrey Mangles, we preach this all the time. I think you probably had that discussion when you had your round table about the CCPA, mm -hmm. but I can't preach it enough because this is the biggest area that we find our clients have trouble with. And that's just that. Before you can create a process where you can, for example, allow a consumer to opt out or to ask you to delete all their information. Before you can do any of that, you have to understand all of the information that you have and where it is and what you do with it and how long you keep it and all that kind of information. And so creating your data map, creating an understanding of where all your information is, is the underlying step that, that I think really has to be done. Now, I know that nobody likes to do it, but all companies have done, you know, an incredible amount of work to keep track of all of their physical assets. They're gonna know where every one of them is, they're gonna know how long they've had them, they're gonna know when they're uh, end of life and need to have new ones, you know, whatever. Everyone's gonna keep really good track of that. But hardly anyone does that with data. And if you think about it, the data is probably far more uh, useful and probably far more valuable than any of the rest of it. So that's kind of something that underlies everything here. Um, so understanding your data. And as part of that, like one of the corollaries to that is you have to understand your risk. So you have to do a risk assessment to understand how your data uh, what the risk is of losing it, letting it get out there, and what the risks are that you have in, in your system, what your system vulnerabilities are. So those two things underlie sort of everything that we're going to talk about here, and I don't think we can preach enough how important they are to do.
Yeah, no, absolutely. And as you were talking, as you see, I, I moved on to this next slide, which lays out kind of the, the categories, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, ab absolutely true what you're saying. I mean, we we work with our clients to help them develop that information inventory. It's the second of these sub bullets, security management of sensitive and private information. Uh, again, it, it's a hump you got to climb over. It's not a natural, easy thing to do as we sit with clients and begin talking about, you know, what information they're collecting, who has, if you will, ownership of it. That is who has the decision making as to how sensitive it is and who should have access to it and who shouldn't have access to it. Uh, they're not thinking this way yet. They, in this case, being our clients, uh, would we, it's just, you know, they all kind of have bits and pieces of it. And we've done a couple of webinars on this. It was partly last month's webinar on the information inventory. We talked about this, but you can go back uh, to some of the earlier webinars as well. And this is a subject that has come up on, on, on several occasions in, in webinars. Um, it's almost like, you know, if, if you don't know where it is, how can you manage it? If you don't know what, it, what is, it is, how can yeah. you manage it? You know, those, those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we harp on this. And I, and I, and I, and I, as you mentioned, you've said it in a lot of different ones of these seminars, but it's because this is the one area where uh, we find uh, companies fall down more mm -hmm. often than not, is that they just don't know what they have or where it is or what they're yeah. doing with it. And mm -hmm. you, you have some general idea. You're going to know generally. You're going to have um, clear things that you're going to know about, like your customer list or something like mm -hmm. that. But that is not the same as knowing uh, where all of the data is and what you're doing with it. And so, you know, I, we harp on that a lot. We don't have to harp on it anymore here, obviously. But, but it is the one area that I find when we start talking to, to clients about, uh, particularly if they've had a breach or they're um, in litigation about this stuff, where you go back and say, do you, can you give me that? Can you give me something that shows me everything? And it's, very, very rare that we find mm -hmm. that company yeah. account. Yeah, we find that also true. Um, the idea as well, and it's it's not written on this slide. It's implicit rather than explicit. Had you know, had we talked about this a little more, I perhaps would have made this more explicit. That all of this is risk based. Uh, you know, it's it's that at the bottom line, and it's the top bullet here: information security management. To us, that means somebody's in charge. There's a group of people that is reflective of the organizational structure that collaborates together to make sure that all of this stuff is being managed. Um, we find as well, they really need information security subject matter expertise. Oftentimes an organization will think that's being provided by their IT vendor uh, without you know, casting aspersions on any IT vendors that are out there. Some are good, some are less good. Uh, rarely is there that security subject matter expertise available, though. Uh, uh, this being hockey season, Stanley Cup playoff season, I equate it. The difference between your IT people, they're the forwards and the defense on your hockey team. Your security subject matter experts, that's the goalie on the team. Doesn't matter how good your defense is, you're not going to win without a goalie. <clears throat> so that 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 distinction we find uh, absolutely important. And that goes into skipping over secure the human. We'll come right back to that. The, the two bullets, secure the management of the IT interface. That's who has access to all this information the access control that's managed by IT and then security management of the IT infrastructure, uh, the whole, ne all the networks and what's in the cloud and what's on the local network and how that is being managed uh, as, well, as, as well. All of those things and, you know, just to, to continue the list, uh, security assurance on third parties, that's actually built into the California security privacy law it's it's the the one clause that I noticed when there's you know the law number whatever that every business in California needs a security program reasonable practices uh, and the law ex explicitly talks about third party uh, assurance uh, if you're familiar with the NIST framework information resilience is how fast you you said it earlier Rachel that we're we're never going to be able to keep breaches from happening 
So resilience, how fast can you detect a breach? How quickly and how thoroughly can you respond to that breach? And how quickly can you get back to business as usual, if you will? That's resilience. And then the last of these on the bottom, uh, governance is, are the people at the top paying attention to this? Is, does the board involved? Is, are, is the C-suite involved? Um, as a piece and then jumping back to just real briefly on secure the human uh, and we've had webinars we've had a couple of webinars on this already uh, on, on what that has to look like but that's all the the user training and and ultimately changing culture here we we see these categories if you will as 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 necessary to have minimum practices you want to kind of jump in and amplify anything i said yeah, I'd like to, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the categories yeah. that, that we have here. You know, the first one that you talked about in the beginning was the subject matter expertise. And I can tell you from being a computer geek for a very, very, very long time, everybody thinks that if you know anything about how computers work, that you know everything about yes. uh, technology. And, you know, I certainly know since I am the IT department at my home, I can tell you my husband thinks I can do everything related to the computer. And I don't want him to know that that's not the case. So, you know, don't anyone tell him. But, you know, I don't know how every single thing works. I just, you know, I'm a good guesser. But that's true of your IT departments as well. We assume, oh, those, those are a bunch of guys and gals that all know about computer stuff. So they know all about this cybersecurity and this privacy uh, information. And you know what? They don't. And in fact, very, very few of them do because it is a very specialized area. And so you got to not assume that your IT folks just know all of this stuff no matter how many buzzwords they can say or catchphrases they put on their website if they're outside vendors that you're using. Um, you really need to be able to find people who actually have the subject matter expertise and who can give you uh, references and who can show you real information about um, uh, their experience in the past showing that they do actually have this subject matter expertise. That's going to be really important because otherwise you're just going to have people who are going to check off boxes for you but then when, uh, when you have a breach, you're going to go back and uh, the regulators or your uh, opposing party litigants are going to come in and take apart uh, what your structure is. And the first thing they're going to do is establish that your IT folks don't know anything about this area. So that's something to be very careful about. We also understand that a lot of companies outsource um, the, these, these things. So it doesn't have to be people that are inside the company. Smaller companies often can't have somebody who, who really has these kinds of expertise in-house, and that's fine. You can outsource, but you should outsource to people who you know, really know what they're, what they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just as you say, that the, the IT people. Uh, so when our company goes in with a new client, one of the things we do always is do a, a network vulnerability scan of, of the network. The, uh, think of it as are all the, the updates and patches in place and, and other stuff is, as well. Um, and on average, we find uh, 1.8 critical vulnerabilities per device. So a company with 100 devices, small company, 100 people, 100 devices, um, that 100 of the 180 critical vulnerabilities on their network uh, those are wide open for the bad guys to uh, jump in and, and, and exploit and, 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 and take advantage of. Uh, so yes, absolutely, uh, definitely uh, necessary to really get that subject matter expertise and, and make sure that, you know, the IT, and, and it's this is not a hit on the IT folks. They can be doing the best they know. Yeah. Like you said, I'm the I'm I'm the IT support staff here in my family, and, and like you said, you know. But what your husband's expect, you know, my wife is always, you know, hey, something's not working. Like I'm supposed to know how to jump in and fix it, you know. And you know, it's takes a village, you know, <laughs> as we say. That's it's true. all of us working together. <laughs> no one of us has has all of this knowledge that way that's pretty good um, I wanna... although i have a pretty good track record at my uh, in my particular department oh good yes yeah yeah i want to just show on the screen right now 
uh, this is the website is mrsp.securethevillage.org. You can get to it. Just go to securethevillage.org and look at the resources. But this is, we're at version 0 0.90. We're not finished. We expect to finish this by July 1 when we want to communicate this to the Attorney General as a set of, of, of reasonable, uh, minimum reasonable practices. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, online and if you track down to what we were just saying on the IT side one of the things we've done is gone very deep into the IT side of this this is uh, the Center for Internet Security um, their um, controls it's, it's version 6.1 they're already up to version 7 uh, we just had the time the resources to go back and update but as a set of minimum controls um, it's these these still work as as minimum at some day we'll raise the bar with when we go to version seven but we took each of the critical controls and there's 20 controls that the cis has uh control one is inventory your authorized and unauthorized devices it goes to you know if you don't know where your information is then you can't protect it if you don't know what devices you have you can't know what's on those devices so there's that need for inventory and what we did is we took each one of these controls we worked with it vendors on this to help us with it. What's reasonable in the mid-sized and small market? Those things that are underlined, like here in 1.1, those are required. We just see, you know, if, if you know, you've got to have an automated asset inventory discovery tool in place. Others of these, like 1.4, some of them are some of that's required. That's what's underlined, but you also see some of this that is addressable mobile phones tablets laptops uh portable devices remote devices workers people working at home those are harder to get your arms around so well we say you've got to address that we don't require that in fact you document that to the same extent that you would document all the devices on your network or in the cloud or, or wherever uh, so I, I want to call that to everybody's attention. Go use that. This this is this stuff is meant to be a resource to the community. That uh, take it, use it as best appropriate. Give it to your IT people and say, hey, are we doing this stuff? Because again, Rachel, you're the attorney. You've got to defend the company, as you just said. You know, uh, if you're not doing these kinds of things, uh, and please add feedback, but I would expect that the other side plaintiff's attorney is going to be all over your IT department this way. Well, and this, by the way, is a great tool. I recommend that everybody go and take a look at this um, spreadsheet that the Secure the Village folks put together. It's, it's really good. It has some really practical information about the kind of things that, um, that you need to do. And again, some of these things are, are really just just minimum but one thing i also want to remind everybody about is that the things that are minimum today are not going to be enough tomorrow and that's another thing you have to be really careful about here is you have to take a somewhat flexible approach and i'll, and I'll give you sort of one one thing i've been thinking about a lot lately um i've been in the computer business for i don't want to say how many years but it's been a long time and I can remember getting on to computers when I first started working at IBM uh, in, uh, in uh, the 1990s and logging on to the computer with my password and, and doing that for all those years. So that was the early 1990s. Here in 2019, we still use user ID and passwords as security across uh, many, many systems. This is a very old school way of doing security. It's incredibly easy to compromise. And so you, we really need to we really need to move on from that. And I think we're gonna see that in the next few years mm -hmm. that we're gonna move into a lot of different areas. Like for example, um, two-factor authentication is becoming much more prevalent now. Now, you know, I don't think there's a minimum requirement right now that everybody have two-factor authentication for everything they do in their systems. Um, but I think that will be the minimum at some point in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you need to keep you need to keep abreast of the developments in the area because these minimums, this this uh, bar is going to raise as the years go by. Right. I, I, it com I completely agree with you on both points. The multi-factor authentication becoming 
uh, mandatory, if you will, as a minimum. Uh, but then also just this idea of managing it, taking it as seriously. I mean, how do we manage finance? How do we manage operations? Somebody is responsible. They put together plans and strategies and procedures and those things. And one of the things, is, as we talked about in the run-up to the show on management, um, we have a client, for example, that that right now uh, is is coming. You know, they 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 they've been working on this. And I was talking to their IT folks last week, and the question came up. So, you know, here's something that we know we have to do, but we don't have the resources to do it right now. We got a lot on our plate. Uh, how do we handle that? And and what I said to them was that uh, what what you need to do is put a plan in place. You know, that, okay, here's what we're doing this quarter. Here's what we're doing next quarter. Here's when we're going to get that thing that we know we have to do done, you know, maybe three quarters from now or a year from now. But you've got something that's reasonable. You can show somebody, here's what we've got. Here's how we manage this stuff. Here's what we're doing. It's like, how can they argue with that? You know, I mean, they, yeah, I definitely think that's right. That that reasonable means that you have to have you have to have reasonably considered what it is that is required and have a plan in place to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I think even with um, GDPR, even with GDPR becoming effective, and uh, some of the authorities looking at that have said that in the initial stages, at least that they've been willing to cut companies a little bit of slack, at least if they can show that they have a reasonable plan in place for coming into compliance in, in a reasonable uh -huh. amount of time. And so I do feel like that will be uh, the case here too, but you know, the plan can't go on forever. It can't be a plan that gets <laughs> deferred uh, That's right. forever. Yeah, that that that's that's also true. Let me go back to the uh, to the to the slides and and move on to the next one. We're kind of wrapping it up right now. Uh, but we 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 secure the village. We really just if if you we please if you're watching this, uh, take a look at 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 these minimum standards. Review them. Uh, comment on them. Provide feedback. Um, it does take the village to secure the village. So any feedback you can provide us, uh, just makes it all better for all of us that way so 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 please please do that if if you would um any final thoughts on this before i kind of wrap up the webinar look at what are we going to do next month and you know those kinds of things my final thought is always my first thought on this stuff map your data know where it is map your know data yeah 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 map your data know where it is yeah know who's got know what's sensitive what isn't uh know who has authorization to provide to say who has access and and who doesn't manage it what a novel concept you know uh <laughs> yeah that, that that kind of thing uh, okay so uh next webinar we don't have a date yet the the first thursday of the month next month is july 4th obviously we're not going to have a webinar on on july 4th uh it's either going to be july 11th or july 18th i'm still checking with the my planned guests for that but we're going to look at risk management in the two contexts. One is the NIST risk management framework that they've put together that it, I find just, it's phenomenal. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a good thing. And we're going to tie that into Cybersecure Southern California 2019 and the Pepperdine Grazio Dio Business School's very, very innovative CYRP program. Uh, my guests are going to be uh, first Howard Miller, who you've seen a couple of times on, on these webinars. He's a member of the Secure the Village board. He's also, like I am, on the CYRP advisory board. And we'll also have uh, Charlotte Griffey Brown. She's the professor of information systems and technology management. She's the chair of the CYRP advisory board. And this is really her, uh, her baby. I mean, she has really done a phenomenal job of, uh, of, of, of uh, putting this, this program together. It's a, a fabulous, fabulous program. Uh, integrates all the various aspects of, of risk management uh, together. Uh, and, and like Howard's on our board, Charla's on the Leadership Council for Secure the Village as, as well. Uh, there won't be a webinar in, in August, uh, the first Thursday in August. I will be uh, watching the Great Migration in either Tanzania or uh, Kenya, not sure which which of those two countries I'm going to be in on on that fourth Thursday, uh, but I'll be there instead of doing a webinar. So we'll have the July one, we'll skip August, and then we'll pick things up again in uh, in September. Uh, 
as as always, we try to make these uh, webinars practical, real world, actionable, how to do them. They tie into the resource kit. And just like the minimum standards are online, uh, there's the resource kit that we built. All the other webinars, they're online as well, securethevillage.org. And what we're about is, as we talk about it all the time, turning people and organizations into cyber guardians. Between the webinar series, focus groups we have, the resource kit, uh, the code of basic practices that we built uh, a few years ago, uh, the minimum reasonable practices that we talked about today, and, and community-based programs as well. Uh, we hope to reach, you know, have uh, some announcements on, on some of those things, uh, uh, community-based programs real soon. Uh, also, we're connecting in now more um, with other organizations. I just want to give a shout out to a couple of, of them. Uh, one is California Cyber Hub. Uh, right now, there are 10, 12, 15,000 job openings in cybersecurity in just the Los Angeles area with an expectation that nationwide we're a few million short by next year, the year after. California Cyber Hub is all about uh, educating uh, broadly K through 12, but very explicitly high school and junior high school uh, kids, uh, helping them get into what is a, a career of the future uh, cyber for cybersecurity. Uh, they just held a uh, recently a, a mayor's cup that I was able to participate in, as was uh, one of my business partners, Kimberly, Kimberly Pease. Uh, she was also involved in that um, and uh, just was uh, did a presentation of the Los Angeles uh, uh, City Council as, as well. So, so good work that they're doing. LA Cyber Lab. Uh, it's a nonprofit that was set up by Mayor Garcetti uh, doing fabulous work here in Los Angeles. We'll have them on uh, one of these webinars coming up real soon. And the work that NIST is doing, like, uh, you know, we've got uh, NIST as our keynote speaker, but NIST has a whole program, uh, National Initiative on Cybersecurity Education. Really, really good stuff. So I want to call that to, to your attention. Uh, for more information, uh, my contact information is here. Rachel, yours is as well. Uh, if you go to Citadel, our company, you can sign up for a free news and news of the week and uh, weekend vulnerability and patch report comes out every Sunday. Please follow us on on Secure the Village on LinkedIn and and follow Citadel as well. But uh, certainly follow Secure the Village that way. Uh, and for marketing and sponsorship opportunities, please, please, please uh, send me an email uh, and and we'll get you into the uh, you know let let you use these as a way of going out and, and reaching your your market that way better. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank you, Rachel. You have been fabulous. Uh, super, very, very good discussion uh, on, on minimum reasonable security practices. Um, and uh, as you said, final words, know where your information is. Exactly. Document that. Yeah. Thank you so um, much for having me, Stan. And thank you for everybody for participating. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you back, Rachel. Uh, as, as we say, it takes the village to secure the village, and we're grateful that you're part of the village. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, on this. Um, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.